Hello, I'm Katerina Soko, a correspondent for Greek Media in Washington, D.C., a non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. Welcome to the special screening of Searching for Andreas, Political Leadership in Times of Crisis. I am very happy to be discussing this fascinating documentary with the filmmaker and my good friend, Harris Milonas, as part of the March screenings of the Hellenic Film Society. Harris is Associate Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at George Washington University and the Editor-in-Chief for Nationalities Papers, researching nationalism and diaspora, among other topics. Harry, I understand that with this film, you wanted to explore the deeper causes of the recent financial and political crisis in Greece. How did you decide to embark on this journey to study Andreas Papandreou's legacy in the aftermath of the Greek debt crisis? Thank you, Katerina, and thank you for having this film. Uh, thank you, Hellenic Film Society. Initially, uh, as you know, everybody in Greece, but also uh, everybody in the diaspora were really concerned with the situation that was uh, evolving in 2009 and then uh, onwards uh, with the Greek uh, and broader European financial crisis. And, and of course, this was precipitated by a global financial crisis uh, that began in the United States, and you've researched it quite a bit. Um, so, so it's not surprising that I would be interested. Now, why Andreas? Why leadership, right? Um, so there, I would say um, there are a few things that drew, drew me to this personality. First of all, there was a lot of discussion at the beginning of the crisis uh, in the parliament, but also on the virtual walls uh, about who is mostly responsible, let's say, uh, from the different political parties or leaders in Greek, modern Greek history. Uh, for what happened, right? Uh, and and a lot of the people um, that um, I talked to uh, would point out um, uh, that Andreas was, you know, very much responsible for a lot of these. And uh, secondarily, they would mention other leaders, uh, maybe most uh, obviously, you know, the most recent uh, government in Greece that, you know, that really um, had an impact on the public debt, but but more often than not, you would hear things about Andreas Papandreou and his rule. Um, so I wanted to explore that to an extent, and at the same time, uh, a really interesting um, political biography of Andreas Papandreou came out by Stan Dranus, and I was trying to make all of this jive, right, uh, come together. Like, how can we have a political leader uh, um, and um, an academic, a really prominent academic? that had such a, an amazing career in the United States and an economist <laughs> above all, um, a very famous economist, be responsible for what was happening in Greece um, about two decades, decades after his death almost, right? O over two decades. Uh, well, actually not at the time, not. But at the time I was doing the documentary, it was two decades, but not when the crisis started. But when the crisis started, it was already you know, uh, 14 years after his death. So, so how do we make sense of that? That kind of motivated me initially. Um, now, that would have produced probably a more biographical documentary where we would just trace this. But at the same time, I, I collaborated with Magnus Bream, my uh, producer in Greece, and also um, my co-director, Thodoris Prodromidis. And we, together with Stan, uh, we tried to think about how this documentary could be something more than just that, and also take us through um, the legacy of Andreas after his death, right? Uh, which was, after all, what was contested uh, quite a bit in Greece at the time. And that led us to a documentary that um, ends up with um, uh, kind of a working hypothesis that you will see in the documentary about the role of charismatic leaders in political life and uh, especially the void that follows from the departure of that leader from life. And you have some amazing footage in the documentary of uh, the times of the early 80s, the political passions uh, of the era uh, are very vivid in your film. For some of uh, uh, the people in the younger generation, uh, Greece might feel like a foreign country, how, how it's portrayed in the film, the footage of the era. And I'm wondering how much was Papandreou's uh, populism at the time a product of that era, of Greece at the time, of the, of the international um, alliances and the state of the world at that 
point in time in the early 80s. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, many people probably won't recognize uh, the country, as you said, uh, in the sense that there is a lot more um, participation, maybe there is a lot more, um, maybe the forms of participation have changed for sure. I mean, there is a lot more digital participation today that wasn't available then. So it's not that people are apathetic today necessarily, uh, but these, these, as you said, the pictures and the emotion that comes out of a lot of these um, rallies that we have. And I want to thank uh, again, once again, the Andreas Papandreou uh, Foundation for providing us with this footage. So, and in particular, Nikos Papandreou has been really uh, supportive in this effort. And um, we, uh, we are just showing some excerpts, as you said, from uh, society in the 80s, and you see uh, the passion and the polarization, right? Uh, and the, the vilification of each side, it's, it's very clear that the passions run high. Uh, we have to remember or maybe remind some of the younger viewers, as you mentioned, uh, that Greece was coming out of a, a long uh, period uh, or depending on how you cut it, uh, either it's in the post-Civil um, War period still, right? Uh, and more recently, of course, it's in the post-Junta period. Um, and for some people, and definitely for my, you know, my hero in quotation marks in the film, uh, he definitely connected these two eras. Um, so he wanted to connect the people who were um, feeling betrayed by the outcome of the civil war with the people that um, were, um, I guess, um, um, who uh, grew up in the period of the Labrakis assassination by the um, uh, para-state organizations, as they were called at the time, with the post-junta or the anti-junta movement. In his head, at least, he represented all of those generations. And uh, to a great extent, what you see in this footage could be seen as this um, vision materializing into these um, pictures uh, and this footage. So I think it's very vivid. Um, and, and as you said, it, it shows a very different uh, Greece. Um, and I'm not sure that people have to be nostalgic or not, but we're just observing right now, right, the differences. And I think that's the spirit of your question. There is no doubt that Greece is a different country today. And there is no doubt that there were things and, and, and policies, as you will see in the documentary, that took place over the 80s, and in, including actually just the election of a socialist leader, right? in a country like Greece after decades of, of um, primarily um, center-right, if not right-wing uh, politics, that was seen as a, as a big breakthrough and as a sign of how consolidated Greek democracy was, right? So um, I, I don't wanna steal the founder of the specifics maybe uh, that many of the talking heads or our, our protagonists will talk about. Uh, but um, yeah, that, that's a one way to answer your question, I guess. Yes, and I'll just say that you also have some very important interviews with both uh, some of the key political rivals mm. and allies of Andreas Papandreou. One thing that struck me uh, when watching the documentary was uh, uh, the different uh, perspectives they had of Andreas and how they would view him as both unpredictable but also as a realist at, at times. And uh, I'm wondering, surprising even his own allies on many occasions, so I'm wondering how much you think that um, this is a personality trait, that charismatic leadership uh, has and you know in Greece uh, a whole movement uh, was uh, named after Papandreou Papandreism and that reminds us of uh, some more recent uh, uh, tendencies to name movements after political leaders uh, least of all or most of all right now in the, in the U.S. with Trumpism and so I'm wondering how much do you see this as a common thread in charismatic leadership? So there is no doubt that um... Andreas' style of rule was uh, very different from, um, you know, Costa Simitis or other um, uh, leaders of PASOK or other prime ministers in Greece. Uh, he was much more um, centralized. Uh, his style of governance was much more centralized. Um, there were very few constraints on his rule uh, by the party or by the state institutions, for that matter. He, in fact, changed 
uh, some of these institutions himself to make sure that this is the case, including, for example, uh, the constitutional change that uh, made uh, Greece's political system much more prime ministerial, as we would say, right? So um, there are some elements that have to do with the structural um, uh, ways that uh, sometimes we associate charismatic leaders, uh, the structural uh, ways they rule, uh, and that's uh, a centralized way, um, not accepting uh, criticism and, and so on and so forth. But then there is the more um, popular, not just populist as many like to call it, but popular side that there is a, a wide um, range of um, the population of society that uh, completely sees these people uh, as the saviors or as um, having supernatural um, powers as my mentor, uh, George Mavrogordatos uh, says in the film. So we, we don't know when some charismatic leader takes over what's their intentions and even what they're gonna do, right? So by calling them charismatic doesn't mean we're, it has a, I know this term has a positive connotation usually, right? Uh, because of its etymological meaning, but in Weberian thought, and that's the way we're using this term in this film. Um, and at least that's my intention as a writer uh, here. The, the point is that a charismatic leader could be someone who actually uh, ends up harming society, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally. We usually cannot really fully tell these type of differences. Um, and that harm may not be even the harm that happens at the time. Uh, it could be the harm that, hap that comes with the emaciation or the weakening, if you like, of institutions and checks and balances in a country, right? And I think that's where you can start seeing some um, uh, analogies that can be drawn even between, you know, people uh, that uh, you wouldn't expect me to mention, like uh, Eleftherios Venizelos, right? Professor Mavrodatos has written on Eleftherios Venizelos from that um, lens, showing that even in the case of such an important politician that almost every political party in Greece claims some type of connection to him. Um, he actually often, although he was, or maybe because he was a charismatic leader he, in a Weberian sense, he often ruled in ways that um, did not necessarily uh, observe all the checks and balances or the institutions that as much as they could have. Once that happens, uh, if society does not have the adequate uh, institutions or what Weber would call uh, if we don't routinize the charisma in institutions, right, then you won't be able to survive as an institution, right? So um, PASOK as a movement, uh, uh, it seems that it's um, now it's kind of seems it seems obvious, but uh, when other scholars like Takis Papas and others were arguing that, uh, it didn't seem also obvious. Uh, after Andreas Papandreou died, um, had a hard time um, routinizing or institutionalizing his charisma in the party. It could have happened. It's not. Uh, it's not um, uh, uh, preordained that after the departure of the charismatic leader, there will be there will be collapse. But oftentimes we see the effects of this weakening, as I said, of institutions of things like um, uh, intra-party uh, democracy or um, uh, all sorts of ways to. Um, uh, deal with differences and uh, disagreements in a party when for a long time, the longest time, you didn't have to do that. The supreme leader, right, would, would decide. Well, Harry, thank you so much for this insight. We're looking forward to watching the documentary. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you again for your time today. Thank you. And thanks to the viewers for taking the time. I hope they find this uh, rewarding. Thank you.